Uh, we're starting a new series today called Life Course. And it's not just a series, but it is actually a course that we are offering here at the net. It's made up of four parts or four legs to the course. It's, you know, it's kind of the metaphor of running the race. You know, this is our course that we run. And uh, so there are four parts. The first part is about God. And we're going to talk about that today. And we're going to talk about who he is. And in, in this, this course that we're offering is interactive. It's discussion. It's question and answer. It's, it's, it's not just sitting in a room and listening to someone give you some information so you can take some notes. But we want this course to be life transforming. Whether you are uh, someone like me who's been walking with the Lord for a long time uh, or you're brand new to Christianity, we want this to be helpful to you. Um, so the first part is all about God. The second part is all about uh, you, who you are, who we are in Christ. And, um, and, and then the third part is about the church. It's about who we are collectively and how the church works, how it operates, what God has planned for the church. And that, that part is one that I'm particularly excited about because we are going to hold that part at the vision camp and we're going to do these interactive uh, exercises, these team building exercises, which we really uh, are going to have, we're going to have a lot of fun with that. And then the fourth one is all about how we influence others uh, with the love of Christ. And so we're very excited about this life course. And so we decided to do a series on this. And I just want uh, to brag on Julie Johnson, even though she's not here today. She's never here whenever I mention her name. But uh, I want to just to say a word about Julie. Our, um, our GROW team has been meeting uh, over the past couple of months. And that team is made up of uh, Lene and me and uh, Sandy Pickett and Kurt um, Lindsley. And we have, and Julie Johnson, of course. And so we have been meeting and we've been uh, discussing this whole life course thing. And after all of the discussion, after reading through a lot of material uh, myself, um, I finally came to uh, this point where I said, I know what I want it to be, but there's not anything out there exactly like what I want this to be. I want it to be interactive. That was the main thing. And I liked uh, the purpose-driven material. I love uh, Rick Warren and Saddleback Church and Purpose Driven Life and Purpose Driven Church and those books that he's written and, and all that curriculum. I love Celebrate Recovery, of course, because we, we do Celebrate Recovery here on Sunday nights. And I love that whole program. It's life-changing, life-transforming. And so that's the material, that's the guts of what I really connected with and what I really loved that I had, that I'd read. And so I said to Julie, and Julie has her degree, I'm not sure which degree, but she's about to get her doctorate degree in, from Alabama. Okay, roll tide, roll tide. War Eagle, road. balance, you know. Fair and balanced. Um, so she's about to get her doctorate uh, degree in curriculum. And she said, I can write this curriculum for you. And I'd never seen anything she'd written before. So she goes away for like two or three days. And she comes back with this whole curriculum, all four parts, written out for anybody who, to, to take that and, 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 and be able to take that material and be able to lead this course. And so I was just, I was just very uh, just amazed and, and so proud of her for, for what she's done. And uh, so we are going to start this course in September. And that's what this series is based on. I just wanted to make sure that you knew that before we started. And so uh, this is not actually the course that I'm going to teach today. I'm not teaching from that material. Uh, but we are going to talk about our first subject of the course, which is God. And when you are around people like I am who um, do not have a past with God, they don't have a relationship, they don't have um, this, uh, you know, maybe a church or, uh, you know, a, a, um, they don't have a, a relationship with Christ. When you're around people like that, 
This question is always in the back of your mind and their mind. And that is, why should someone follow Jesus? Why is it that we need God in our lives? And that may sound, uh, you know, it may sound to you like that's an easy question to answer. But for a lot of people, it's not so easy to answer. And, but the answer is simple, as is Christianity. Christianity is simple to understand. It's not hard to understand. And the answer to this question is simple. And it is this, that God is good. He is good. There is no one else that is good but God. God is the only one that's good. And all good things come from God. So here's, here's what Jesus said in Mark. He said, why do you, he's talking to the rich young ruler, and he says to him, he says, Why do you call me good? He says, No one is good except God alone. The rich young ruler had come to Jesus, and he said to him, uh, Good master. I think he was trying to get on Jesus' good side. So he, says, he calls him good master. And Jesus said, Why do you call me good? So he didn't know who Jesus was. He says, Why do you call me good? There is none good. There's no one good except God. This is what Jesus said. And then James, James says this in chapter 1. He says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like uh, shifting sand. So everything that's good comes from God, and he does not change. This is so good for us to know. This is so good for us to understand. that. and, And if you don't, know that God is good. If you, if you maybe have read the Old Testament and you wonder, is God really good? You only need to look at Jesus because Jesus is the image of God. The, the scripture says that he is the express image of God, of God's person. It says that in him dwelled the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh, First chapter of John says he was in the world and the world was created by him, but the world did not know him. So if you want to know if God is good, look at Jesus, because this was one of the reasons that Jesus came, is to show us who God is. He was God in the flesh. You want to know what God's personality is like? Look at Jesus. You want to know what his heart's like? Look at Jesus. Jesus is our example. Jesus is the one that we look to whenever we want to know who God is. And so I believe that every person, every person deep in your soul, you have this innate, this inborn desire for what is good. Now, a lot of people that I talk to will say, yeah, but you know, I also enjoy things that are bad. I really... Now, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody that... Anybody here that enjoys things that are not good? Okay, we have some, pe- some bashful people. It's okay. Uh, I know. I know what that's like. There, it's called sin. Okay? It's called sin. And we enjoy things... That are not always good. So there's that side of us. The Bible calls this side of us. It calls it our sin nature. It calls it the flesh. Uh, and, and Jesus talked about this in the garden. He said uh, on the night that he was betrayed. Before he was crucified. He was in the garden. And he said to his disciples. He said the spirit is willing. My spirit is willing. But my flesh is weak. See a lot of people don't even understand that Jesus had a flesh side, but he never gave in to that nature. Can you imagine going your whole entire life and every time temptation comes, you say, no, without fail your entire life. That's what Jesus did. He said no to every single temptation and yes to his father every single time without fail, blameless, totally blameless, before God and all humanity. But that's not the case with us, right? We have this, this flesh side to us that wants to do things that 
uh, that are not good. And what the enemy has done is he has disguised these things by making them look good. And even more importantly, and this is the key, he has made these things feel good. You know what I'm talking about? Whatever your particular struggles are, whatever your particular struggles are, are they, they, it may be overindulgence in, in some particular thing, <clears throat> may be some particular sin that you struggle with, but I guarantee you this, in that moment when you are engaged in whatever that thing is, well, maybe, it's, maybe it's gossip, maybe it's overeating, maybe it's you know, alcohol or, or something of that nature. Maybe it's relationships, or what, whatever the case may be. In that moment when you're engaging in that, it feels good. If it didn't feel good, you wouldn't do it. But it feels so good. And most of the time what I've found is that feeling that you get when you're doing that thing, it, it brings you comfort. I've heard Lene talk about comfort food. You know, comfort food. Her mom says there's, there's nothing that soothes your soul like a good piece of bread. You know, I mean, it's, it's comfortable. It brings you comfort. Whatever those things are, those unhealthy things, those things that appeal to your sin nature, or your bad side, those things bring you comfort. But Jesus said, I'm going to send you another person. He said, I'm going away, but I'm going to send you someone called the Holy Spirit, and he is the comforter. He is the comforter. The enemy has disguised sin as being comfortable. And it makes you feel good, and it makes you feel comfortable for a short time, and then you feel lousy afterwards, right? It makes you feel really good for a short time, and then it wrecks your life. It makes you feel good for a short time, and then relationships break up and, and you, jobs are lost and, and things go haywire in your life because it's not good. But there's this other side to us. We had this discussion with uh, my young men's group a couple of weeks ago. Are we all born with that good thing in us? Are we all born with that? I think, we, I think it's in our spiritual DNA that we want the good things of God. I think that, that, that when we're born into this world, there's something in there that's programmed deep in our hearts or in our souls that we want what's good, even though we may deny it, even though we may rebel against it, even though we may go the opposite direction, even though we, and this is the big thing, we don't believe that that's what we're going to love. We think that it's going to deprive us from what we really want. But if we really knew what we want, it would be this thing that is good. This desire that desires good things. It would be the good things that God wants to give us if we knew what we really wanted. I remember when Lene and I were dating. No, no, no. This is before Lene and I were dating. I remember this. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, this is off the cuff, okay? It's not part of the sermon. But I remember we were going for a walk uh, one day in her neighborhood where she lived. And uh, we had stopped and we sat down on the sidewalk and we were just talking. And at this point in our relationship, I had decided that I wanted to marry this girl. We weren't dating. We hadn't even talked about dating. But I would already, already decided this was the girl for me. This is the girl that I wanted to marry. She didn't know it, but I was praying every afternoon when I got home from work. I would spend an hour or so just praying that God would give Lene Long, Lene Lou Long, to me. And, and so I had been praying, and I just knew in my heart that my heart of hearts Deep down, this is the one for me. I've been praying for her. And she began to tell me about this other guy that she, she just 
love this other guy. This other guy was just everything that she had always wanted. He, was, he had the look. He had the talent. He, he had the charisma. You know, he had the personality. He was just, he was just it. And she said, what do you think about that? And I said, I think you don't know what you want. And she didn't. She didn't know what she wanted yet. That's the case with, with us. We think we know what we want. We're going in a certain direction because it looks good to us, right? It looks like that guy did to her. You know, he was the right size. He was the right height, you know. He had the right amount of muscle mass, the right ratio of shoulder to, you know, shoulder to waist ratio. Yeah, do you not know what I'm talking about? So, she, but anyway, he looked good to her. He, he, it, it, to, to her, that was it for her. She didn't know what she wanted yet. She wanted a slightly less attractive guy. And, um, but what she really got, I'm going to tell you something. What she really got, let's get serious for just a second. What she really got was a person who knew Jesus, and although I didn't have all the answers, I had the answer, and she was the most fearful person that I, ever, I had ever met, and over those first few months of our relationship, she began to tell me her greatest fears, and I would open up the Bible because I, I, I had spent, you know, probably hundreds of hours reading the Bible, and I would open up the Bible to the place that would give her the answer to the fear that she was articulating to me and over those first few months what no uh, psychologist psychiatrist counselor book prayer session whatever she had gone through before what none of those could do for her God did for her over those first few months see she didn't know what she wanted she didn't know what that desire was deep inside her and that's the way it is with us so how do we get it? Jesus said this. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And I noticed something about this. Asking is easy. It takes almost no effort to ask. But a lot of us don't even ask, do we? A lot of us just live our lives without asking. And I was reading this. I got convicted about this yesterday. Uh, when I was reading the scripture, I, I thought to myself, you know, I, I'm not asking God every day for his righteousness in my life. I'm not asking him. I'm not actively asking him for things that I want. I, I desire these things, but I'm not asking. But Jesus says, ask and it will be given. He says, seek. Now, seeking requires a little more effort, doesn't it? You, you read a book, you seek in your situation, you, you're actively looking in every situation, every conversation that you're in, you're actively looking for Jesus. He said, seek, and you will find. It takes a little more effort. And then he says, but and everyone who knocks, to everyone who knocks, a door will be open. That takes more effort. He's like, you are knocking on the door. You have come before God. You're knocking on the door. You're actively seeking him. You're asking him. And he says the door will be open. In fact, Jesus, if you don't believe that Jesus wants the same thing for you, the same things that you want, that you deeply desire, these good things for yourself, just think about this. Jesus said, behold, I stand at your door and I am knocking. He said, if you will open the door, I will come into you. And I will dine with you. I will partake with you. And what he's talking about is spiritual food here. So he says, he says, ask, seek, and knock. Then he says, which of you, if your son asked for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would give him a snake? Which one of you would give your child a stone if he asked for bread or a snake, can you imagine that? He said, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? 
And then he says this. This is the simple part, y'all. This is simple Christianity. This is Jesus' type of Christianity. It's not a lot of theology. It's not church history. You don't have to learn everything that has ever been said about Christianity to know Jesus or to spend hours and months and years learning in order to get what Christianity is. Jesus says this. He says, so in everything, this is one phrase in a sentence between commas, do to others what you would have them do to you, comma, for this sums up the law and the prophets. All of it is summed up in this simple phrase, do to others as you would have them do to you. Any of you ever seen the movie or read that book, uh, The Diary of Anne Frank? You know what I'm talking about? She was, uh, she was uh, killed in the Holocaust. This is a quote from her. No one has ever become poor by giving. No one has ever become poor by giving. This is the sum of it all. If you want the good things of God, ask, seek, knock, and do to others what you would have them do to you. Um, when we first moved to Huntsville, let's see, that was 2002, it was about 2004. Hampton was about four years old, and Hampton's here today. So I'm going to embarrass him a little bit, but uh, Hampton was about four years old, and, uh, and he was a cute little thing. Boy, he looked just like me whenever he was, uh, <laughs> when he was a kid, four years old. He was full of energy, always has been, just full of energy, full of life. Um, and we went to an Easter egg hunt in, in Huntsville. Now, I had never seen an Easter egg hunt done like Hunt civilians do Easter egg hunts. I've never seen this before. I've been in church my whole life, and I've never seen. When I was a kid, first of all, you, you, the, the fun part for the kids was everybody would boil the eggs the night before and dye the eggs. You remember when we used real eggs for Easter egg hunts? Um, and then we would hide them in snake-infested bushes and... Uh, <laughs> The places around the church where we ne never send a kid into that, those places now. But when I was a kid, you know, you looked everywhere for the eggs. But uh, things are much safer now. So we, get a, we have an open field, and I've never seen this done before. And then you just take eggs, and you just fill the whole field up with eggs in plain sight. There's no hiding to, to the egg hunt. There's no, hunt, there's no honey, hunting. Hunting. It's called an egg hunt, and it's really it's what it, it's just an egg gathering. You just gather up the eggs and you put them in your in your basket. And so we had gone to this egg hunt, and I was just amazed. They were like, go, and all the kids run, and just gather up as many eggs as they could. And Hampton was pretty fast for a little four year old, and he had filled his basket full of eggs, and these eggs were plastic eggs, and they had uh, candy in them. And Hampton would do anything for candy. I mean, he was candy-driven as a, as a kid. And so he had all these eggs full of candies and prizes and things. And he, his, his basket was full. And as we were leaving uh, the, the place, I forget where, I think it's, uh, well, it doesn't matter. It was some place we were having an egg hunt. And um, so as we were leaving... Uh, Lene and I and uh, Hampton were uh, going back to the car and we see this woman and she is frantically running to the egg hunt with her kid. She's got her kid pulling him, you know, and, and she's running and he's another kid about four, about four years old too. Maybe, uh, I think Hampton said he was about three, uh, three years old because he knows, knows the guy's a year behind Hampton. So Got a four-year-old and a three-year-old. The, the four-year-old's got a, a basket full of eggs. And then the other kid, you know, he's running. And she sees that the egg hunt is over. And she kneels down and she tells her son, she says, I'm so sorry, but we were late and we missed the egg hunt. And the kid just hangs his head. And he's so sad. And 
So we're standing here. The, the lady and her son are standing opposite of us. And without anybody saying a word, Hampton just starts taking his eggs out and putting them in that kid's basket. Over and over and over until he had filled this other kid's basket up. He had emptied out at least half of what he had and given it to that other kid. And then the kid raises his head. He's got a big smile on his face. The mother is beside herself. She's hugging Lene and she's just saying, oh, thank you, thank you. And she's hugging Hampton and she's just so grateful. So uh, I'm blessed. Lene is blessed. The woman is blessed. The kid is blessed. And Hampton's standing there with a big smile on his face. He's blessed. One act by a four-year-old kid has blessed five people. Just that one simple act has given a blessing to all of the rest of us. That is God's way. You cannot get poor by giving. There's another story I read this week. <clears throat> this, uh, these parents, uh, they had kids and, and they had to bring grandpa to their house to live with them because grandpa couldn't take care of himself anymore. And he had a problem with his motor skills. And so he, some of you may have heard the story before, but, it's, but he, he uh, was trying to eat one day and he, and he knocked his, accidentally knocked his bowl off on the floor and broke his bowl. And so the parents, not wanting to uh, have any more of their dishes broken, they got him a wooden bowl so it wouldn't break. And they made him eat out of a wooden bowl. And so one day they came home from work and they saw their uh, son out in the backyard with a piece of wood. And he had a knife and a chisel and some tools and he was carving on that piece of wood. And they go out to him and they said, they said to him, what are you doing? He says, I'm making a wooden bowl for when you and dad get old. <laughs> you don't want to be like... The parents who chastise the old man because he can't eat out of, a, you know, out of a glass bowl. Be like, don't be like them. Be like the kid, Hampton, who gave his eggs to this other person. And even better yet, be like Jesus. This is what I love the most about God is he did not just leave us here to fend for ourselves. He came. He gave up. You understand? He discarded his power and his, 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 uh, his royalty over the universe and became a man. A man who was obedient to the Father. And... He showed us who he was, but he did not ask us to do something that he would not do. He went to the cross for us. And I've been through this a million times, I know. But he went to the cross and he was crucified for us. He was tortured for us. And the scripture talks about all the things that that torture meant for us. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was, the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes. We're healed. And we know all these things. He was, he was bruised for us. Um, and then he went to the cross and he was crucified for us. And he nailed the ordinances that were against us. The sins that were against us. He nailed those to the cross. And then he, wrote, he went into hell itself. And who knows what he did in hell to pay the price for every sin, for every person. And then he rose again. And then he says to us, he says, if anyone would come after me, he said, let him take up his cross, his cross, and follow me. But he's not asking us to do something that he hasn't done. When he says to you, do to others as you would have them do to you, he's already done that for us. And the Apostle Paul said this, he said, you strive, but you don't strive to blood. You and I. We have things that we strive through, right? 
We, we have that sinful nature that we deal with, the, these temptations that we deal with, but we're not striving unto blood. But he's saying, take your cross and follow me. 